Good morning to people in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Sydney. And good evening to people in London, Paris, and Milan. Welcome to Finance Mandarin's Reading Club. I am Tara from Finance Mandarin. Firstly, I thank you all for joining us from different parts of the world. In this episode of the Finance Mandarin Reading Club, we are going to dive into the book named From the Great Wall to Wall Street by Mr. Ray Yen. Today, we are honored to have Mr. Yen to share with us some insights into this book. If you're interested in international relations, this is the book you should not miss out on. First of all, please allow me to introduce you to our host today, Vian Lee, the CEO of Finance Mandarin. Vian has over 20 years of experience coaching CEOs, investment professionals, and lawyers from the buy side to sell side of the capital market. Let's welcome Vian to say hi to us. Good morning from Hong Kong. This is Vian Lee, and I would like to welcome Dr. Wei Yen to join our Finance Mandarin Reading Club today. Thank you for all of you. Well, I would like to, on behalf of the Finance Mandarin team, we are doing well, we are safe, we are still positive. Thank you for all your care and sending the greeting. So now I would like to get back to Tara. Thank you, Vian. Of course, today we are very honored to have invited Mr. Wei Yen, the author of this book. Mr. Yen is an adjunct professor of finance at Pepperdine University. In his 16 years in Asia, he was the managing director for Moody's and Lemon Brothers and group treasurer for City Pacific. Without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Wei Yen to say hi to our audience. Good morning. Thanks for having me here. I'm really honored to be here to present a book that I've written several years ago. And uh, the reason why I wrote this book called uh, from the Great Wall to Wall Street, and the subtitle is uh, a cross-cultural look at leadership and management in China and the U.S. Because I was interested in comparing the two culture and the two management styles. Now, uh, I have spent my, half my time working in Asia, around China, and also in the buy side and the sell side also. And also I spent quite a bit of time going to school college in the U.S. and also work in Wall Street and also in the industry. So I have actual experience on both sides. Uh, in between, I also spent a year working as a CFO for a private company in Shenzhen. And then also at my last job, I worked as the group treasurer for City Pacific, which is a listed company in Hong Kong. So uh, at that time, actually controlled by a China SOE. So I have both uh, private and pr public uh, Chinese ex company experience. So i like to present you uh, my thoughts uh, on how to read these two management styles. Uh, next slide, please. Now, I'll try to condense uh, 5,000 years of Chinese history into 20 minutes is, uh, is a task that is very difficult to do. But i, I like to uh, give you my view of uh, uh, my very simplistic view, and it's my own, uh, own personal view, that uh, about these two cultures. Uh, most people would agree the current Western culture, the one we emphasize democracy, freedom, personal choice, and all that uh, came from, the, it's a heritage of the Greek culture, uh, came from the uh, early Greeks, uh, uh, Socrates and, and Plato and Aristotle. And Socrates was of course the one to champion the critical thinking. Uh, and then also, if you are involved in law and, and business, you would be familiar with uh, Socratic thinking, uh, Socratic process, where you cut a problem into its minute portions, and then you have to take a position, either for or against. Now, uh, Chinese don't always look at the opposites that way. Uh, in fact, the symbol on the left is the, uh, is the uh, Tai Chi symbol that you're all familiar with, or the yin and yang symbol. This symbol has been around uh, from uh, historical records, about 3,000 years, or maybe even longer. Uh, so you have two halves that are undulating, kind of opposing each other more, but no one side can overwhelm the other. And each side also has a component of the other side in it. So this is the brilliance of the Chinese uh, wisdom. Uh, there, there are all kinds of uh, other cultures that also have a similar symbol, but no, none of them have these small component or the opposite within them. So what that means is that uh, there is you in me and there's also me in you. 
So when I make a decision, I try to oppose you, I got to be careful because I might be hurting myself as well. So this is uh, how you interpret that. Now on the Western side, you have two black or white halves. And so the idea is that uh, either they will contest each other, they are adversarial, and each, either one side will win, the other side must lose. So you want to be the winner, you don't want to be a loser here. Now, because of the Chinese way looking at things, you tend to look at the middle way. You can take the, take the path in the middle and you look for common grounds. And uh, I, in my book, I talk about uh, the games people play in, in Wei Qi, Go, or the, the martial art Tai Chi, or uh, there's a, an art of war, uh, Sun Tzu's art of war. And everybody should read that if you're interested in Chinese culture. Now there is a companion comparison book that you also should read if you're interested. And this is called uh, On War. This, I don't know if anybody see it. On War, this is a book by, uh, by Karl von Clausewitz, a uh, German military strategist. And uh, these two books, Sun Tzu's Art of War and The On War by von Clausewitz, uh, are the two texts that people study at military academies around the world. And this, if you read it and you understand the way you look at strategy-wise, look at different situations and how you approach it and how you uh, approach a, a strategy to overcome your enemy and are totally different. And so I would encourage you to study them if you have time. Uh, next, I'd like to go to the slide showing the GDP growth. Uh, yes, this one, thank you. Now, uh, from two, 1997, this is the year I arrived to work in Hong Kong from New York. And uh, also this is the year where we had the Asia financial crisis. Now, so that's a good starting point because every country in, in Asia was decimated. Now, at that time, China's GDP in normal dollar terms was about uh, less than 1 trillion US dollars. Now, fast forward to 2020, and that's the latest year we have World Bank, World Bank figures. And that number is 15.31. So it's about 16 times higher than 15.3 uh, times higher than 1997 period in, in a period of 23 years. Now, that means that if you were making about, say, 500 RMB in 1997, that would be the amount for a factory worker or office worker that today you ought to be making about 15 times that much. So it's not, that, that's minimum, okay? Usually people get more than the GDP increase in salaries. Now, Vietnam also is a very Confucian society. Their growth is also phenomenal during that period of time, over 10 times. Now, if you look at Hong Kong, which a lot of us reside, have resided in, uh, which I like to visit uh, once the pandemic's over, now the Hong Kong GDP over that period of time is only at about two times, growth about two times. Now, if you say go back a few years and compare the, uh, the uh, growth uh, between 1997 and say 2017, a 20 year period of time, uh, Hong Kong's growth was actually higher. What happened? Last few years, we had a lot of issues uh, with our Hong Kong governance. And that's why the economy has stagnated. Uh, whereas in Macau, uh, which benefit from, uh, from the uh, casino goers from China, and also a little more stable government, it grows a lot higher at 3.5 times. So this is instructive. Now, why is that so? In year 2000, the then party secretary of China, Mr. Jiang Zemin, he proposed what is called a three represents. Now, represent what? One of the represents is to represent the good parts of the traditional Chinese culture. Means that the, the government would not fight anymore. They would not do class struggles. They would not do things that a very Western inspired model of, of a strategy of, of gamesmanship. They would now go with the Chinese model, which is working together, seeking the common ground, and, and get things done, work together, get things done. Well, lo and behold, they got a lot done during that uh, 20 some period of time. So this is, this is very interesting because if you want to understand China going forward, you have to understand its past. 
And you have to understand or get an appreciation of his culture, of his philosophy, the things that actually uh, embedded in people's behavior, uh, all, all Chinese people's behavior. Now, Westerners' uh, behaviors are easy to understand because they are everywhere. They are in, they are in movies, they are in songs, they are in food, they are in the clothes that we wear. Uh, they are a lot easier to understand. But in Chinese, a little bit more complicated. It's, it, it's more embedded. Okay. Now here, I want to talk about the Chinese being a high context people. A high context people meaning that there's a lot of components within a message. There could be a lot of hidden message. There's a lot of something that is uh, overt and something is a little subconscious. Now, if you grow up in a culture like that, you will understand what these things are and you would take that for granted. Now, if you're not from that culture, you are from say a Western country or Western inspired education, then you might find it difficult to understand uh, people from a high context society like, like, like China. So, so uh, the way to do that is to, again, I would say, understand the philosophy, uh, read about uh, classic uh, test, test, and try to uh, talk to or understand, uh, talk to people and understand uh, what they mean. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Now, the, uh, because of these uh, contextual uh, preferences and also philosophical basis that are different. So you have a, a Chinese people tend, also Chinese people, their cultural heritage came from being uh, the ancestors of farmers. So farmers uh, take a long term horizon. You plant your seeds, you wait for the germinate and you, you, you cultivate it and you harvest it. So it takes about several months. So it's a long term horizon. So Chinese people then generally have a bit more patience because of that. And the Westerners, they, you know, like a Greek culture, uh, the Greeks were more like merchants, uh, more like seamen and merchants in those days. Uh, their, their lands are not uh, uh, very uh, uh, good. They, they have a lot of uh, mountains and hills in, in their country. So they're more like uh, merchants. So they had more time to analyze the universe when they are traveling and they think about things a little more uh, differently. So, so a Chinese will have a more longer horizon because they, they put in their own land and they think about these things in longer terms. Uh, now, I said earlier that the Chinese is a high contest people. Therefore, they retire a lot on mutual understanding. Now, the Westerners, because they are low context, linear thinkers, they tend to be bound by legal contracts. So when you go to a meeting in China, in dealing with Chinese people, there are a lot of things that are unspoken, but that should be understood. And uh, to pick up the nuances of these meetings and what, they, what uh, people talk about, then you got to spend some time trying to understand it. Now, perhaps I would suggest taking more classes from finance Mandarin, that will help you too. Now the Westerners tend to, abound, tend to be bound by legal contracts. Uh, the Chinese generally rely on mutual understanding. So uh, it, it would be foolhardy to try to take a Chinese customer to court because they had uh, violated a contract. That's not the way how things done. Uh, in 1997, I was working with Lehman Brothers in Hong Kong. We had a case where we uh, trading partners, uh, bankers had uh, uh, dealt with a major SOE, a trading partner. And that partner lost some money on trade, and then they reneged on paying. So we took them to court. Uh, that was court was in New York, New York State, New York court. Unfortunately, that kind of pissed off all the state-owned companies. Now, when you try to sue somebody in China, a major company, you you cause them to lose face, and they were kind of unify and gang up together against you. So we had a very difficult time in trying to get, get deals in China because of that. Because even though this, this SOE company was a fault and people in China knew that it was a fault. Later on, we have to find a solution for that, that but that's not the, 
uh, the topic today. So uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Now, uh, because of these cultural differences, and we uh, in Chinese generally believe that getting together uh, in a group and do things is, is powerful. It's, unity is power. And Westerners tend to think that uh, diversity, uh, taking the best of each person, uh, that gives you strength. And uh, the Chinese, the last point is the Chinese tend to be warm and fussy. Uh, but they, whereas the, uh, the Westerner uh, tend to be more direct and critical. Uh, this has nothing to do with the upbringing or the education level. This is all has to do with the culture. So I, I think I uh, used up all my time. Uh, I hope that uh, I, I get you interested in, in this. Uh, uh, all my book, uh, if you're interested, they're available in Amazon. Uh, but uh, if you're interested in Chinese culture, and uh, one of the best ways to do it is to uh, talk to VN. Uh, she, she, she can uh, introduce you uh, in some English versions of these, uh, of these topics. Thank all you, right. Dr. Yen. Pear, pear, I'm done. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Yen, for your sharing. Um, VN is a huge fan of your book. Uh, probably she might have some questions for you. So shall I pass the time to Vien? Uh, please do. Thank you, Tara. I met uh, Dr. Wei Yen four years ago. And uh, when you launched your book in the bank, uh, American Bank of Chambers. And since uh, I got your book, I bought the book. And then I find that it's a great treasure. Since then, I introduced this to Thank all you. our students. And then they starting reading the book and then we discuss in the class, especially those decision makers, they have huge portfolio in China. Normally they will ask a question, especially Dr. Yan, you mentioned about, this is a takeaway for our students, our, our audience today, the different worldviews. What would be the major takeaway from the book that you spend a lot of time and your experience writing? Can you give us a good summary for that? Well, I think so. Uh, I will, I'll do it this way. I think the, <clears throat> um, a lot of people, uh, especially Western educated people, tend to think that uh, China is a more backward version of the West. Eventually, uh, Chinese people will be like everybody else in the West. Now, that's true in some ways that we all wear jeans, we all drink Coca-Cola, and we all like uh, watch American movies and listen to songs and all that stuff. But that's just superficial. Uh, the way Chinese think and do things uh, are very different than, than what uh, Westerners. Uh, so I think the, uh, the chart I showed you the earlier comparing the yin yang symbol and also the, the, the circle two halves, this is, I think, is, crystallizes the difference between uh, the Chinese thinking, the Western thinking. The uh, Chinese, uh, the Western thinking is an adversarial uh, thinking. Uh, the it's always uh, sometimes you are, sometimes you wonder why why there are so many uh, conflicts in the world and we always seem to try to have an enemy and this is just because the Western way of thinking they just think that they have to win they have to win by beating the other side and you you find it in business meeting in, in so you know you you know also in you know, personal relationships and everything. Uh, the Chinese just thinks differently, and and it, it's more like an yin yang symbol. There's you and you, the you and me that we got to work together. And when you have this system, although at uh, uh, on the surface there's fewer conflicts, but uh, there are a lot of lot of confusion or frustrations as well. So, um, but there are, um, I think, all in all, there are pros and cons of each one of these worldviews. I think we should look at the ones that fit us most for what we do and for our own personality and our own upbringing and, and background. And I think the, uh, since most people are more educated on the right side, I think it's probably better for us to learn a little bit um, of the, the Chinese side by reading his classical texts. Yeah. Right, said. We've been coaching quite a lot of the senior executive from the asset management, insurance company, um, private equity and hedge fund. 
when they got the chance to visit the Chinese regulators, for example, CSLC, CBIRC, PBOC, SAFE, they are in the meetings. And then they always have a question, what's going on? What should I say? Why I've been waiting for such a long time to get into the meeting? Should I say something? Why the only the boss is talking and then the, all the other are silent? What's going on? They have this kind of question that actually very resonates to the book that you mentioned about. So what would be the advice that you for those big asset giants currently that are applying for the license to try to get into the China uh, capital market? What would be the best advice for those Westerners, decision makers, or Hong Kong Asians uh, decision maker, which they are not native Chinese, they might not totally understand the Chinese culture. What would be the best advice that you give to them, Dr. Yen? Well, first of all, these uh, these uh, leaders of the, the the kind of organization talk about China, they have seen plenty of West, uh, outsiders, uh, Westerners and uh, Chinese Americans and other Asian Americans. They've seen plenty of them. They they knew how to judge each person. So uh, it would be best just to be honest and be yourself. And um, the, you will never be uh, like a Chinese. Uh, you shouldn't pretend to be one uh, because they know that it's phony. Uh, but, but bear in mind that there have seen plenty of, of you going there to pitch for business, to plead for uh, regulator approval and all that stuff. And also bear in mind that there are two kinds of meetings. One is uh, in, in an open forum where you have maybe 10 to 20 of them and then a dozen of you sitting across each other and try to talk about uh, things in an hour or two. And those are not the meetings that will solve problems. The meeting is solve problems actually behind the scene. The behind the scene, like in dinner meetings, uh, in, in uh, uh, casual cocktails or whatever. If you can get one of the decision makers to private meetings, then you can talk about a lot of issues with them. Uh, they can also tell you what they actually need. Um, uh, when I said that uh, in the meetings like that, the, the overt is not the important. Uh, we all know we have the job to do, and these are the goals we try to achieve. And they, they will be honest to tell you where they are, but they're not going to tell you everything because they want to keep something to themselves. They are certainly not going to tell you the decision process uh, because a lot of times they don't even know until the last minute uh, what that should be. Uh, but if you are, uh, say, a coverage banker, uh, which I was at one time, and you got to know where everybody in the party, you know, in, in the party that you're dealing with, who the roles are. Uh, some are working team members, uh, some are the uh, liaison, uh, some are the assistant uh, to, to the big boss. Now, in Chinese company, the assistant to, to, uh, uh, to the CEO is a very important person. He's not a secretary. He's the next CEO to be. So you got to spend time with him. He's a generally younger guy, uh, a very hardworking guy, and he's the, your main, main contact. You should spend time and understand him and what his needs are. His needs, not just his official needs, but his other needs, you know. Um, maybe Great he has advice. a, yeah, maybe he has a friend somewhere. He, he wants you to help him find a job and stuff like that. Uh, so you, you gotta find out what, what those are and try to know him a little bit. And, and, and stuff like that takes time to, to cultivate. Um, and uh, sometimes you have to see the guy every week and to find out what his interests are. And so he may be, then it would have opened up a little bit telling, uh, telling you where uh, the process is and uh, what are the issues that, that his boss is deliberating. And, uh, and there's, there's always the powers that be in the organization. His boss may not be the last one to make the decisions. Yeah. It could be somebody else, it could be the, the most senior person in, in the organization. And there yeah. you have to touch all bases before you can get to him. Excellent advice that we actually also bring the book and show to the decision maker. And then, so that's why they also invite us to provide the workshop, like how to deal with a stay-owned enterprise, 
And then Dr. Yen, that what your advice is an excellent example. So next round, when we have this kind of workshop, bring into different investment banks and different asset giants, we definitely would like to invite Dr. Yen to come to give us a, a talk. Because you not only have the theories, you all also have the practical experience and how to dealing with the government official, understand the political parties. This is the way it's top-down decision-making. That's excellent. Yeah, so we still have time and actually we have a long list of questions we want to deal with. Today, it's just a little bit taste to showcase how excellent the program Finance Mandarin can bring with the insight and value to our connection, to our students, to our friends and alumni. If you really like to know more, example, just give a little introduction. Dr. Yan mentioned about the GDP growth here and why Jiang Zemin, Sanga Daibia is so important. We haven't even covered so recently the common prosperity, Gong Tong Fu Yu, starting from Xi Jinping and then top down and how does the system with three uh, income allocation starting from the first level, second level and three level, we'll talk about that. And since a lot of students here already today, you already know that we cover a lot to this one. How can we make the cakes bigger? <laughs> and this is something we talk about efficiency and fair. So we we'll talk about this in the coming section. And then if you also like to know how to conduct business meetings with Chinese officials or your China stakeholders, China counterpart, how to pitch to them, how to win their trust. This book, Dr. Yen's book, from the uh, war, uh, Great War to Wall Street, it definitely is a good guidance for you to look at. If you want to personally talk to us and learn more finance many communication, it's the time to talk to us today. So I will get back to the time to Tara and thank you for Dr. Wei Yen today. It's an excellent insight for us, Tara. Thank you, Dr. Yen and Vien for your insightful sharing. I shall wrap it up now. If you target the China capital market, come to Finance Mandarin. We help senior executives to learn firsthand China market knowledge and polish your business Mandarin communication skills. With our advanced AI learning platform, you'll be able to access the course content whenever you are. If you are a busy professional who wants to maximize your investment in learning, Finance Mandarin is the right place for you. For more course details and tips of learning Mandarin, follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Book your trial class now with us. I thank you once again for joining us today, and I hope to see you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent.